Story-Driven Accessibility – How Next-Gen Audio Can Help Us Broadcast More Accessible Stories Presented by Lauren Ward, Alley Camp 2021 We'd like to thank our gold sponsors Telstra and Intopia, our silver sponsors ANZ and Coles, and our bronze sponsor HowTo. Hi, my name is Dr Lauren Ward and I am a research fellow at the University of York in the United Kingdom and I'm really excited to be presenting to you today. So uh, as some may notice, my accent is not really that of Yorkshire lass, it's a little bit more Antipodean. So I started out my, my educational research career in Tasmania at the University of Tasmania and have been in the UK for about the last five years working on various flavours of media accessibility. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. In particular, at the moment, I'm working on a project or part of a project called XR Stories. And this is one of nine creative clusters in the UK, which is basically a nexus for research. And XR Stories in particular is bringing together people working on different uh, aspects of interactive and immersive storytelling. So that's why my topic today is story driven accessibility and hopefully the meaning of that will become a bit more apparent over the next half hour. But the subtitle of this is how we can get next generation audio next generation broadcasting technology to help us to broadcast more accessible stories. Over this presentation, I'll start off with a little bit of a look into what access services for broadcast are like in the UK. What are the good things? What are some of the problems? And how can we go about fixing some of those problems? I'll give you a bit of an intro on what the next generation of broadcast technology is likely to look like and what doors that really opens for accessibility wrap up with a bit of uh, the different research that's going on in the UK and some recommendations for just how to make any story we're telling a bit more accessible. So we'll dive in and start with what the mandated accessibility services are in the UK. And by far the largest is subtitling. How mandated access services work in the UK is that the larger the broadcaster, the bigger share of the audience that they've got, the higher their requirement is to subtitle or provide different types of access services. So for something like the BBC, big broadcaster, big audience share, it's got a 100% target for subtitling. Most of the other broadcasters of reasonable size in the UK have a target of around 80 to 90% of subtitling. Now, according to the statistics from last year, of all the terrestrial, so free-to-air content that went out in the UK last year, 85% was subtitled. And given that some broadcasters have targets well below 80%, that's great. That means most people are hitting their targets for terrestrial broadcasting. But the problem is that up until 2017, when the Digital Economy Bill came in in the UK, the regulator had no power to even mandate subtitling or other access service levels for on-demand programming. And as we all know, that is a large amount of what a lot of people are watching. In fact, you are watching this talk on demand. So this bill that came in in 2017 gave the regulator Ofcom, which is basically the UK version of ACMA, the power to mandate access service provision. But we can see there is a stark difference. Whilst 85% of terrestrial broadcasts last year were subtitled, only 48% of video on demand across all the different variations of platforms was subtitled. So that lack of ability to even mandate, and the mandates haven't fully come in yet, but that lack of ability to even say we need this has really been a problem for video on demand accessibility. So that's the state of play for subtitles. There's two other main accessibility options in or accessibility services in the UK. The next one is audio description. So audio description is, for those not familiar with the term, is a way of verbally describing the visual elements in a piece of content to make it more accessible for people who may be partially sighted or blind. The mandated levels for audio description for most broadcasters um, right from the big ones to the medium-sized ones is about 10%. But 
So thankfully that is regularly exceeded, but 10% isn't an awful lot. The final piece of the accessibility pie uh, in terms of access services in the UK at least is BSL or sign interpretation. So British Sign Language, BSL, is the, sign, the, the main English sign language in the UK. Um, and there are mandates for the larger broadcasters to provide about 5% of their programming either sign interpreted or BSL presented. So I'm making a differentiation there between English language content that's translated into sign language or content that is made in BSL. So it's going to reach 5% and the mixture uh, isn't really tracked. Um, but most broadcasters have really no mandate to provide BSL interpretation, but they do have a mandate to provide funds into the BSL Broadcasting Trust, which is a broadcasting trust that basically produces BSL uh, content and it's freely available to anyone uh, with an internet connection and some of it goes off, uh, goes out via terrestrial. So it's, it's limited, but it's heading in the right direction. And this is sort of, this is the good bit. But if we look at what I think, certainly in my lifetime, is probably one of the momentous moments of, of television history, which is ev almost every country in the world going into lockdown at the beginning of 2020. If we take some sampled screenshots from the various uh, public health um, announcements, we've got Japan, and we've got someone behind a lectern, probably a government minister, Japanese flag in the background. We've got South Korea with, again, government minister, lectern, South Korean icons in the background. We've got France, again, lectern, minister, flags. Brazil, lectern, minister, flags. And humble England, lectern, minister, United Kingdom flags. But there's something that most of these have, and even the ones I haven't pictured here, most of them have. And that's off to the side of the minister behind the lectern is a sign interpreter. Some are a bit more stern, some are a bit more expressive, but there's that sign interpreter there, except for England. Where's the interpreter? It wasn't even the United Kingdom that, that failed to provide a BSL interpreter. Scotland had an interpreter. Wales had an interpreter, it was England, Downing Street, that lacked having an interpreter there. And just to add insult to injury, the NHS and other government messaging that went out on social media and other platforms like that, so we're talking videos, but some of them have text, which means that it needs metadata so that that text can be read out by screen reader. And these videos, I have a screenshot of one of these up and it's from the NHS of so the National Health Service. And it's basically a message about mental health and who you can reach out to if you're worried about coronavirus. Lacked the necessary metadata for someone visually impaired to access that information. This is one of the most momentous things that have happened in most of our lifetimes. There was no interpreter. That information wasn't accessible to people who spoke sign language as a first language, and you lack the metadata for people using screen readers to actually access vital health information. How did we get this so wrong? We have loads of mandates. We're actually achieving quite good levels on at least subtitling. How did broadcasters and the government get it so wrong? I realise that's quite an open question. I realise it's also an absolutely massive question that we could probably spend the whole of the next three days trying to answer. Because there are so many socio-cultural, technological factors that play into this. But for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to focus on the one that I think is actually the biggest problem when we talk about creative and broadcast industries. And that is the fact that access services are an after the fact solution. They're included after the content is created. They're a band-aid or a plaster, depending on your uh, vernacular and which side of the world you're on, that is applied 
and we're like hopefully that will hold together for all of the audiences that need to watch it and it's it's it causes us so many problems both at a big level when we rush to create content in an emergency we just forget that these access services and metadata are necessary but even if we're talking about content that's produced slowly and deliberately like dramatic pieces production teams don't review the audio description they don't even write the audio description a third party provider usually does that when they do their final review of the episode what they mean by final isn't with subtitles with audio description it's just the visuals it's just the audio and the problem is that we all lose in that scenario. We have consumers getting a poorer product and content creators having their content, the intent of it is just not conveyed because they're not involved in making sure that the audio description reflects what they were trying to achieve with their content. And this is like encapsulated quite neatly by the amount of different threads on Reddit about subtitle spoilers. And what I have here is just a screenshot of one of many that says subtitle spoilers is a thing that doesn't get enough attention. I'm so tired of having important plot points spoiled by, in this case, they're bemoaning Netflix's subtitles, but they are not alone. You would think that whomever is creating them would know better than to include certain information. And what they're referring to is the fact that you may have a character that's disappeared and we're not sure whether they come back. We're not sure whether they're even alive. And something's said off screen and it's subtitled as being from that character. So whole episodes can go by and the person who's watching the subtitles has already had that revealed spoiled. And this happens because the people that are creating those narratives, building the suspense and shaping this story for people, are not involved in the process of actually making that story accessible to people. So how do we do this? How do we make accessibility part of the content creation process? And I'm not, I'm not going to uh, delude anyone. This is not easy. And it's particularly not easy for standard forms of content because we have so much baggage from decades of ways of working and workflows and, and ingrained procedures. I'm not saying we shouldn't challenge those, we absolutely should. But my research and my practice has mostly been looking at how we can take things that are already gonna disrupt the process, new bits of technology that are coming in and changing the way we think about things anyway, how can we get on board with that and make sure that these changes in technology not only bring us better picture quality or better sound quality, but make it more accessible? How can we take these new technologies and make sure that we get accessibility right in the first place, rather than current content where we're perpetually trying to reverse engineer accessibility? So in order to discuss what, uh, what we can do to make new technology more accessible, what does this new technology look like? And I can think of no better way to explain the difference between traditional broadcasting and the next generation of broadcasting technology than cake. Here we have a picture of a cake. I baked this cake, it was a nice cake. It's a cake. It's a chocolate cake, you can't really see that because it's smothered in orange icing and it's got some nice little twiddly bits of, of icing in a contrasting colour to make it look a little bit fancy. This is traditional broadcasting. It's delicious, it's great, we love it. But it's a finished product and what goes out to your home is a finished product. And if that's exactly what you were hoping for, then that is great. But if it's not to your liking, if it's too big, too small, you don't like orange icing and you've got to scrape it off. It's a subpar experience if you want anything other than the average requirements. Much like traditional broadcasting. Object-based media, which is the next generation of media, is different. Here we have a picture of many ingredients that might go into a cake. We've got cocoa powder, baking powder, flour, milk, raisins, all of these things. There are objects, there are ingredients. 
Rather than sending the final cake, we send the ingredients. We send a recipe card. It's got the recipe for how to assemble these ingredients. And then our television or set top box acts as the chef and puts them all together in our home. And the beauty of this is whilst the recipe can encode things like what the content creator wants in terms of this sound should come from the left or come from 90 degrees to the right, it can also encode, and when it's put together in your home, what you want out of the piece of content. So to use the actual correct terms, we've got all of these ingredients or objects. The recipe is metadata, and it's basically data that describes these objects. Where should they be? How should we use them? How should we assemble them in our home? And the chef is the render. It's the one that does the hard yards to put things all together. So rather than it being rendered by the content creator or the broadcaster and sent as a finished product, all of the pieces are there. But it means that we've got a huge amount of ability to create personalised and adaptable content because we can change how these are put together. And to uh, get the final bit of mileage out of the cake analogy, it means that if we're allergic to raisins, we don't have to pick them out of the final pr uh, product. We just don't put them in in the first place. So this gives us a huge ability to be able to create access services that actually work for the individual. But it's not all good news <laughs> because with great variety of options comes great responsibility. We now have so many things that we could possibly let the end user change that it could very easily become totally unusable. So this led to the question that was at the heart of the research that I did over my PhD, which I finished a couple of years ago. And the question was, how do we make personalization for TV that is intuitive and easy to use for the end user, whilst we make sure that we retain the content's creative integrity and give them enough personalization ability that they get a better experience out of it. And this was particularly looking at hard of hearing listeners and television content. So how do we balance these factors and create something that not only has a really neat suite of accessibility options, but also is highly usable. And this is where stories come in, because regardless of whether it's a news piece or a soap opera or the most epic drama, broadcast is about telling stories. We're very much story-driven creatures. So how do we reduce all these options down? Well, we ask the question, what is the intended experience. We reduce the options by going, what are the options that are relevant to that user? And how do we retain the parts that are important for conveying the experience that the content creator wanted to convey? And this led to an approach called the narrative importance method all related to this idea of what is important to the story we're telling. Because we were talking about hard of hearing listeners, one of the biggest challenges when an individual starts to lose their hearing is that while speech by itself can be often quite intelligible, quite easy to listen to, so me in this scenario where I'm the only speaker, that's quite easy. But when there's a complex soundscape with lots of things going on, that becomes quite challenging. And a lot of people at that point don't even recognize that they may have some degree of hearing loss. So they're not reaching for the subtitles necessarily, but they're still having a suboptimal experience. So how do we make content accessible in that case? And we do that by being able to change the balance of the sound objects, make the dialogue and the crucial things more important. And The example that I like to use, because it just resonates with everyone, is the example of Jaws. In most content, we agree, dialogue's really important. It conveys a lot of the story. 
But there are other things that the producers, the content creators, the dubbing mixers are putting there because they also convey the story. In Jaws, without that music, this terrifying shark is just a ridiculous mechanical monstrosity. You can't remove that element in the interest of access or intelligibility because it removes the meaning from the piece of content. Now, I worked with my PhD quite closely with uh, BBC Research and Development, and we collaborated with um, a program called Casualty, which is um, sort of soap opera, sort of drama style program set in a hospital in a casualty department, uh, what we'd call an emergency department in Australia. And in the soundscapes for casualty, it's not even that there's non-speech elements that can be really important to conveying the story. We can have the exact same audio element, something like a heart monitor that's starting to beat faster and starting to, you know, show that maybe someone's about to flatline. And that's a key plot point if someone's, you know, about to go into cardiac arrest. But also the exact same sound can be in the soundtrack just to provide ambience. And these sounds have really different meanings, even though spectrally and, and all of the things that we might be able to automatically pull out of that content to say about that sound would say that these sounds are the same, but the content creator knows that they're not. So this is where integrating into the content creator's process is so important. Because if that metadata treats every similar sound the same, then the user is still not getting a good experience. It's going to spoil things in some places and it's going to miss information in others. When we put that content creator in the loop, we can make sure that the story that we're trying to tell actually gets to the end user, regardless of what needs they're bringing to the table. And the way that we did this um, with the narrative importance work was to embed this in metadata. So when those objects are sent, they go with metadata that tells you how important these sounds are to the overall piece of content. We have a hierarchy of sounds. So the essential sounds in the top section was broken into four pieces. The top section, usually things like dialogue, not an awful lot else ends up there. We have something like a murder mystery or a whodunit. A gunshot's going to be high importance because particularly if that happens off, off screen, we need to know that someone has been shot because that's really progressing the story. But then there's other things like ambient music, door slams, things like that, that are there to, to add to the ambience. But if you've got some degree of hearing loss and you can't take in the whole soundscape, they're things that can be lost. They're things that we can do without and still get a good experience from the piece of content. And it just, it changes so much from piece of content to piece of content because that gunshot that's really important in a whodunit might just be part of the ambience in a war documentary or a historical piece. A door slam that's just telling you that things are going on in the pub in one piece of content might actually be a really important moment where someone storms out and leaves forever. This is why it's so important to tie what we're doing in accessibility to what we're trying to achieve out of the piece of content. And having developed this sort of language, this way of interpreting these different objects and encoding their meaning in metadata, we then created an end user tool and what we gave to the end user was a simple slider. But how that slider acted on the loudness of different objects depended on how important they were to the mix. So at one end of the accessible mix, things that were essential were turned up and things that were low importance were really pulled out of the mix. So we've got a diagram of what's going on here, but I'll explain most of it in language. So the essential items get increased high importance items, they stay roughly the same. Medium importance, they get reduced a bit at that accessible end and low important things, they're almost entirely removed. 
And then the other end, you have what the standard TV mix would be, which all of these lines for the different categories converge to a single point. And what this looked like for the end user was just a slider, like a volume slider at the bottom of a piece of content. And it allowed them to pick this balance of different audio elements that made it accessible for them. Now, we did a number of public trials for this piece of work. It's called the Accessible and Enhanced Audio Trials, which the emergency department in, a, in, uh, in the UK is called A&E, so Accessible and Enhanced. And we worked with Casualty along with BBC Research and Development. We have a picture here of two of the main characters um, sort of embracing outside of the emergency department with an ambulance in the background. I'm just going to give a little bit of an example of some of the clips um, and how the control works. You're no good if you got this to the police. He won't. He did it. He almost got the phone. He's cool. Means he's in, right? Wrong. I'm more still getting used to you. No. We'll jump the bike. But he's your problem. Yeah? A fracture. Query fractured right ankle. He's got abrasions and bruises into right flank. Fracture. Query fractured right ankle. He's got abrasions and bruises into right flank. We also survey, surveyed a lot of production staff and basically talked to them about does this make sense? Is this a sensible way for encoding the meaning that you are putting into sounds when you make soundscapes? Unequivocally, the answer was yes. 100% of our survey respondents said that the approach fitted with their mixing style, which means even accounting for some bias in our sampling means that we've got quite a good understanding going of what production staff have in their mind and a way to then encode that in metadata. We've got an image on the side of this slide that's got um, the dubbing mixer from Coronation Street and you can just see my ponytail in the background and we're playing with some of the nice mixing desks, desk toys at my previous university, which was the University of Salford. And working with these content producers, we started to understand how this might integrate into their workflows, both current and future ones. And for current workflows, it would actually be easy for many to implement, but it depends on how their production schedules and the genre, because again, some content is produced in a real rush. Even when it's not an emergency, there's lots of content that's the turnaround time is very small. Then you've got more dramatic, more cinematic content that has a much longer production schedule. But I think it's really nicely encapsulated the attitude of the production staff to technology like this. Um, we've got a quote from one of the uh, participants in the survey that says, this technology could be liberating for the content creator. So rather than thinking that it's something that might get in the way of the creative practice, it, it's liberating. It would allow the creator to make a mix more like the one they love without having to worry quite so much about those with a hearing difficulty or in a noisy environment. And just to complement this, we've got the sound mixing desk that we used uh, with casualty, with a shot of casualty up in the background. So this is not only more usable for the end user, but this opens it up for the content creator. And this is where accessibility really thrives, where it's not just a particular target group. Even though I went in going, let's make this better for hard of hearing people, it's something that then makes it more usable for everyone involved in all parts of the process. And just to sort of reinforce the idea of getting it right about where it happens in the process, the first episode we had um, where we worked with Casualty, they were obviously coming into something new, a bit hesitant. So they did the review for the episode and then we worked on the new version or the accessible version. And it took 13 hours and that is 13 excruciating hours. It took so long and we made so many mistakes because we're having to take the icing off the already finished cake. We were unpicking things and trying to remake them. And it just, it, it's not how it should work. And it's not accessibility at its best. The next episode that we did with them a year later, 
we'd built this sort of trust, we'd built this language, and they allowed us to go, where do you think this needs to happen? And we were like, it needs to happen much earlier in the process. And instead of taking 13 hours, this took probably about one hour. We took a bit of time to rejig some templates. But once we had the new template there, everyone could do things roughly as they were before, just adding the odd little bit. And it wasn't onerous. And the best example of this actually working was we reset the template prior to the COVID lockdown. But this first version, if we'd have tried to do that with COVID and me being remote to the production stuff, it never would have happened. This new approach, I was there to help set up the template, but then they could go off on their own and do it, and it was easy. So this is the production staff view of this approach, but what do the end users think of it? Because that's quite important. Um, for the first episode we had, we had a survey that went out with it, and 83% uh, said that the control, so this slider that allows them to change the balance of the mix, it made a difference to their experience. We've got a picture of um, the media player with the slider involved and a screenshot from the episode. 73% said it made the content more enjoyable or easier to understand. And over 90%, 92% wanted to see the BBC doing more things like this. So we've got a real appetite for having this sort of personalised accessibility service. And this is not hard of hearing listeners, this is just across the board. And this is what we found with, and, and it's, it's what all good accessibility does, is that it makes it better for everyone. We had people with completely normal hearing going, oh, this would be so good when I'm on the train because the background noise on the train makes it really hard to hear the dialogue. And if I could just strip back the excess elements and make sure I'm only getting the bits that really tell the story, it would make it so much better. When I get home, I can turn it right up because my living room's nice and quiet and I've got quite a nice surround sound system. It's that adaptability, even for a single individual, depending on their circumstance or just how they feel on a particular day. One of the things that I found really encapsulated the power of, of technology like this is a quote from one of our focus group participants who was um, hard of hearing. And she said, audio personalization like this puts us back in control. It means that we're in charge of what we hear. And I think that's quite empowering. And there's an image of a hearing aid on a bedside table in the corner of that screen. So that's, that was my PhD research and has continued on working with various groups to, to push this idea forward. But I'm gonna give another case study before I wrap things up. And this project is called Enhancing Audio Description. I wasn't part of this project, but some of my colleagues at the University of York uh, ran this project. And what it was looking at was how we can take audio description um, and make it a bigger part of the production process, because it is after the fact. It's a third party company trying to interpret what the creator meant. And sometimes they probably get that right but also there's lots of times where that goes wrong. So how can we make this part of the creative process and give visually impaired, partially sighted, blind viewers more options when it comes to accessing audio visual media? And they did this through three main methods. The first of these methods was to take the soundscape and the sound effects and, and sounds that were already recorded and add more of them in there. So creating this richer soundscape. So almost the reverse of what I was doing in my PhD where I was stripping things back. This was adding more in. So the sounds that might give an idea of a location or a person doing a particular thing or even an emotion are added in so that that element doesn't require description. The beauty of something like this is that whilst description requires being inserted in between patches of dialogue, you can have a grandfather clock that indicates that you're back in the living room chiming very quickly in between patches of dialogue. It opens up the options of how we can convey to the visually impaired user what is going on in the visual elements of the, of the content. 
The next thing we used was spatial sound. And by spatial sound, I don't mean surround sound, like 5.1 setups. By, surround, uh, by spatial sound, I mean headphones with specific spatial locations. And this means that rather than having to describe that someone has walked across a room, we can hear their foot footsteps move to the other part of the room. We can hear that the two voices that were spread out are now near each other. We can hear the reverberance of the space that we're in and know that we're in a different space to the scene earlier that had no reverberance because it was outside and was basically a free field. So this was the second element. And the third element was new ways of doing the audio description itself. So rather than it being separate from the, the process, it's part of it. It's not only part of the process, but part of how the story is told. So can we use a first person description of different elements to make an audio description that is more thematically cohesive, that is more part of the piece of content. I'm going to give a little bit of an example. This is the beginning of a film that was used in a lot of focus groups for the project and was one of the first real trials of the various techniques. I sit on my bed, my dingy room full of shadows. The only light is from my window. I face the light, waiting for it to start again. The nurse brings the silver bucket and gets me ready. Mother comes in. I don't know what happened, it's worse this time. She gets the oxygen mask. As something moves under my skin. There's only one way to get them out. Mother takes the bucket away, leaving the nurse to clean me up. And I see, it wasn't that bad. It's all over now. Mother extracts the pearls I have produced for her. And makes a note in her little book. Only two today. But it starts again. <coughs> this time there is blood. over. I look to the light again. And so this project also had really good um, feedback from the focus groups. Not everybody liked it, but there were a lot of people that found this gave a really nice alternative to standard audio description. One participant described it as it didn't involve quite so much concentration. The audio description wasn't intense. You weren't bombarded so much. Just in the background of this, we've got a faded screenshot from part of that piece, Pearl. In addition to this, it conveyed to the authors of this work compared standard audio description for this piece of content with the enhanced version. What they found was that individuals' confidence in how they understood the plot, uh, their feeling of how accessible the content was, their engagement with it, their understanding of the plot were largely equal 
with standard audio description. So this gave the content creator and the viewer a different way of experiencing the content whilst making sure it was equally accessible, equally inclusive. I've just got uh, one of the diagrams from uh, some of the research that, that shows that for the audio description and the enhanced audio description, the vast majority of respondents found that they had a lot of confidence in their understanding of the plot, with most people saying uh, out of five they had three, four or five uh, ratings for how, under, how well they understood. For the original content with no accessibility features, it's far more skewed towards the very confusing low end of that scale. Some people still felt they understood it, but there was no one that was like, yes, the original is very clear if I'm watching it um, or if I'm engaging with it and I have some degree of sight impairment. And some of the other ideas that came out of this was that it created a more communal experience because rather than the person with hearing loss having, sorry, <laughs> wrong project, person with sight loss having um, to have headphones on to hear the audio description, to get the binaural, the real spatial sound, everyone had headphones on. It was an, it was an equalising experience. Everyone was part of it. And one individual in the focus group said, I actually felt that it was, the, and referring to the content, that it was entertaining me as an integral part of the artistic experience. And not just like this poor man, we better do something to give him something. He's missing the lovely colours and all that. Someone has actually bothered to think that you don't always need to see. And there's just a, a shot from Pearl with her hand and one of the pearls in, it, in the corner of that. Uh, slide. And this really brings me to, to the point that I think really cuts through both these new forms of media that we're trying to get things right for, as well as standard forms of media. And that is that regardless of the individual's needs, can we give them an, equiv an equivalent experience, something that's engaging and telling the story that the content creator set out to tell? What I, I like to bundle this up as is what I call the water cooler test. So it's that idea that, and this is a bit archaic, but it's that idea that you go into the office and everyone's grabbing a drink and you're talking about what was on TV last night. Regardless of whether you're sighted or not or have a hearing impairment or not, can you have a conversation about the content? Did you have an equal experience? If it's a murder mystery, did you both have the thrill of piecing together the various clues, regardless of whether those clues were conveyed by audio or visual? And I think that's the test that regardless of what kind of content we're putting together, all content creators should be doing. Can everyone sit back and have an equal experience, whether that's horror, excitement, mystery, education? So I focus quite heavily on hard of hearing and uh, visually impaired individuals in this presentation because of the two case studies that I wanted to tell you about, but I don't wanna leave it just on that because there's a lot of other work that we're doing at the moment, um, particularly at the University of York, but uh, and, and other institutions in the UK as well. So at York, I'm currently leading a project called Accessible Audio for Autistic Individuals. And this project is looking at actually gathering some of the requirements and understanding what autistic individuals need for audio to be accessible. Because what we know is that autistic individuals are using lots of accessibility services, in particular subtitles, but we don't have an understanding of, of what these what is needed from these subtitles to make sure that they're getting the most from them. Um, this is working with some independent content creators as well as the Sheffield Autism Research Lab, which does a lot of work about improving everyday life for autistic individuals. There's also a sequel to, uh, everyone loves a sequel, to the Enhancing Audio Description Project, um, which is looking quite heavily at, okay, we have a good idea, how do we embed this in the creative process and make tools that work for production staff? And we've also got a lot of projects around the XR stories 
um, group. So these include looking at augmented reality for visually impaired users, how we can leverage AI to make the metadata acquisition process in object-based audio easier, and developing content creator workshops. So basically working with content creators to make sure that they are asking the right questions in the process of creating their content. We may not have all the tools there for the, for the next generation of broadcast media, but we've got to make sure that people are at least asking the right questions. So on that note, I'll ask whether you have any questions, uh, if you do, or just want to chat to me about media accessibility, uh, you can contact me at lauren.ward at york.ac.uk. You can get in touch with me on Twitter. I'm the Penguinier, which is spelled T-H-E-P-E-N-G-I-N-E-E-R. Or you can use the uh, Alibyte Slack channel. Thank you for, for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Alley Camp 2021.